What's up Xenoblade X enjoyers? It has been quite a while since my last Xenoblade X related video and I really wanted to talk about this topic for quite a while now. I have gathered all my thoughts to finally make a more coherent video about the future of Xenoblade X and I figured now that we are all patiently waiting for the inevitable Xenoblade X remake or sequel, please be real, it would be the perfect time to revisit one of the most debated questions for the game ever since Future Redeemed released. How does Xenoblade X connect to the rest of the series and does it even connect at all? Well I made a video about if it connects already. For me it is pretty clear that Takahashi's great vision will not exclude X from the rest of the games. Especially now after he connected Saga to Blade as well. If you only want to know the reason why I think X will definitely connect, I recommend watching this video I made to get the gist. But I will still have to repeat some of my points to set up the foundation for what we are working with in this video. Today I actually want to get a little bit more into the details of how it could possibly connect and how the many open questions that X leaves open could actually be explained by something we only found out about recently. Origin. Yes. This device instantly made me think of X and how the life core and the unexplained stuff about Mira could be connected to this device somehow. Questions like, why can't we escape this planet? Why does this planet look like multiple worlds collided together? And how can humanity continue to live even without the life core? All this could potentially be related to origin shenanigans. But let's not jump too far ahead and discuss why I definitely think X is connected, how it would fit into the timeline and how Origin is related to all this. If you enjoy Xenoblade X videos or Xenoblade videos in general, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe and let's begin from the start. First of all, is X connected to the rest at all? Let's begin with re-establishing what we already know for certain right now. The radio in Future Redeemed was an important lore dump that connected the world of Xenosaga to the rest of Xenoblade. For people who have played Xenosaga, they will instantly recognize the name Dimitri Yuriev and also the Vector Industries logo on the radio. This radio is not just fan service and has easter eggs for fans. It actually answers one of the biggest questions from Xenosaga. What happened to Lost Jerusalem and how did it return later? By connecting the games, it all adds up now. Even though some events may not fit perfectly together and need to be retconned, the majority of Saga now connects perfectly to Blade. This radio is the real deal. What we hear here is a real broadcast that happened on Earth before Klaus started the experiment and began the whole Xenoblade trilogy. This same radio conversation talks about some other important events as well. Namely, the Earth Life Colonization Project Exodus that has been commissioned by the coalition government. This is a direct reference to Xenoblade X and even the Japanese original script, which uses a different name for the project, stays consistent for both Future Redeemed and Xenoblade X. It's the same event. Another piece of evidence that X is not forgotten is actually an interview with Takahashi for Xenoblade 3. There he mentions that the Xenoblade 3 title screen was already conceived after development of Xenoblade 1 ended and before development of Xenoblade 2 even began, right in the middle of Xenoblade X's development. This dude right here connected his old 3 games to a franchise that wasn't even supposed to be a Xeno game in the first place. Xenoblade 1 was supposed to be called Monado beginning of the world and completely disconnect from his previous works that all followed the perfect works that Xenogear started. Only thanks to Iwata he finally changed it to Xenoblade and only thanks to its success he retroactively connected it to the rest of his vision. That's all I'm going to say for this part and if you are interested to learn more, I highly recommend my latest video once again. I went in depth about how Perfectworks is connected to all of this and why Takashi definitely planted seeds for everything to connect. Now let's actually address the other important part of this discussion. How does this fit into the timeline? I am still only going to list facts before we jump into theories. If you recall Xenoblade X's story, it goes like this. 
Elma arrived on Earth in the mid-2020s to warn humanity about two alien nations that would wage war above Earth. We now know them to be the Ganglion and the Ghost. With her help, the coalition government built spaceships that can reach light speed and they forged the plan to evacuate humanity into space so that humanity can be saved. It is told to us that when the war started only a handful of ships escaped into space and then Earth blew up. We follow the white whale which survived the attack only to be hunted down two years later by one of the alien factions involved in the war, the ghosts. We make an emergency landing on a planet we named Mira that is seemingly not charted on any star map. Here the quick TLDR that the government gives us is that we lost something called the life core when we crash landed. This thing is where all of our bodies are stored and it is slowly running out of energy. We are telepathically controlling mechanical bodies known as mimeosomes for now that will help us rebuild and recover the life hold. If we don't make it in time, like the beautiful clock in the big tower is telling us, we will all stop functioning and humanity will be lost. It doesn't seem to be an easy task though, because the other factions that had the war above Earth, known as the Ganglion, are also on Mira and they are trying to wipe us out. Even the ghosts are hunting us down, even though they are at war with the Ganglions. Why? Well, you will see that there's a lot of unexplained stuff in this game. So after getting the quick synopsis, we can see that this doesn't fit the events that Xenoblade 2 describes at all. Klaus does not mention any alien forces, rather a group known as the Saviorites that attacked the government and the Beanstalk, and Earth never blew up as well. So this can't be connected, right? Well, the disappearing Earth is easily explained. If I show you this cutscene, can you tell me which game this is from? Doesn't it look like Earth blew up? This was Xenoblade 1, and this is Xenoblade 2. It had a big explosion and the world disappeared. We now know it's split into two different dimensions, but from the outside you can't tell the difference. It looks like Earth just blew up. And the alien forces? Only because it was not mentioned, does not mean they couldn't be having a war above Earth as well. I want to be a bit more clear here and say that it definitely does not fit 100% right now. We don't see a space station in the X cutscene and the radio in Future Redeemed does not paint Project Exodus as an escape but rather an expansion to other planets and galaxies. But then you see Xenoblade Definitive Edition space station is also not shown correctly. They made the effort to give Alvis his core crystal in the remaster but fixing the space station was too high of an effort it seems because it was not supposed to be tilted like this and the interior is also shown incorrectly. Yes, we can blame this on Alvis' memory being hazy if you want to, but the point I'm trying to make here is that these minute inconsistencies are something that come with the territory because Takahashi is retroactively fitting these together. And it's not like they contradict any prior lore. When the next game comes out, they just paint a clearer picture of what actually happened. And to get to the radio describing the Project Exodus as an expansion instead of an escape, this is also easy to explain. The project was kept secret and only the teams working for the program and people with higher influence knew about the actual purpose. Declaring to the world that aliens are going to attack and only a handful of people fit into all these ships before the world explodes would cause mass hysteria and other destructive side effects. Then, oh boy, there is also the coalition government. The Radiant Future Redeemed already shows us how corrupt they were back then. The Saviorite rebels fight for a human rights protection bill that the government straight up denies. They have all the power in the world with the conduit slash Zoha and have an armada of artifices to defend themselves. They are sitting pretty high and mighty on top of the world. More importantly in my first video about this topic, I explained how untrustworthy their words truly are. Remember the whole life core containing our bodies part? Yeah, that was actually made up and we all died on earth and only our data was saved on a giant USB. Remember that we told you that your families would also be able to come with us? Well, actually we just saved the rich and most influential people instead of selecting people equally. Remember that we told you that the ganglion and ghosts were busy having a war above earth? Why are both parties suddenly chasing us across the galaxy to wipe us out? 
Well, they haven't explained that part yet. If you think about it, what do we actually know? Who are these aliens? Why did Elma come to Earth to warn us about the war in the first place? How did she know and why did she come alone to save us? We actually don't know the full story at all. I wouldn't even be surprised if the alien war was completely made up at this point. You want to know why? In a Xenoblade X side story, we actually learned that they have been producing fake humans all this time with completely fake memories. They call them J-Bodies and one of the characters we meet named Yelf is one of them. He thinks he had a past life and even mourns and searches for a friend that he seemingly lost when they traveled here from Earth. A friend that never existed. We as the player only learn about this at the end of his side story, but our party never finds out. If they can implant fake memories into anyone on this ship, who could even say what really happened on Earth back then? Okay, I think we are finally ready to jump into theory territory now. How do I think this fits into the timeline and what could Origin have to do with this? Let's start with Origin because I think it is super exciting and then end with what I feel like the timeline of events could look like. It's this planet. There's something about this planet. Anyone who has played Xeno X heard that line over and over again and the questions of what is up with this planet has tortured us ever since the game released and died on the Wii U. First of all, no one can escape this planet. Not us, not the Ganglion, not even this time traveler. Yes, Professor B claims to be from the future who traveled back in time. We help him build a functional time machine so that he can get back to his time. But when he tries to escape, he just can't leave and expresses, it is like Mira itself is denying my inquisitiveness. Mira seems to be some kind of parallel world that you can't escape. Then there's also the fact that every alien language is automatically translated into something we can understand. This is actually a major plot point that is mentioned in the game. Somehow the planet auto translates the meaning of words into our brains. And what is also really interesting here is the world itself. This giant ring in Oblivia was for a long time believed to be a piece of Mekonis. But to get something more concrete, the Norpon that live on Mira referred to humans as Homhoms. And we actually see that Telethi exists in this world as well. One can see these as neat little references like the Monado pins that Lin has and this was definitely perceived as such for a long time now. But even if you look closer to the actual globe that we got of Mira in the artwork, you will notice that this planet looks like it has completely different sections glued together to form a single planet. The upper part even looks like it could be one of the three space elevators that we know exist in the Xenoblade 2 world. It could be Rathamantis itself. Like these are all different parts of different planets that were merged into one. Does this ring any bells? If you consider that we can't just leave the area, it somehow auto translates, a lot of Xenoblade 1 references exist and that the planet looks like it was merged from different things, it kinda sounds like Origin could have done this, right? But now the most important part, at the end of the game we get two more revelations. This whole time the life hold was actually damaged and shut off. How are the people still alive? Without the data from the life hold, none of the people on Mira should be able to function but also none of them can be reborn or transferred into another body. Their data is lost. But then we see Lao reappear after he died in the fight against Luxar. How did he get reborn? Does Origin now sound more reasonable to you? What if Mira is a parallel world that was created by Origin? It could explain almost every question that remains open in Xenoblade X and would also explain the Xenoblade 1 references in this world. Let's get even crazier. Does this concept of the protagonist's RS somehow look familiar to you? What about this cockpit? These look eerily similar to Ouroboros designs. Especially this one looks almost exactly like Yuni's Ouroboros. Remember, Takahashi already had thoughts about Xenoblade 3 during Xenoblade X's development. This could just have been scrapped content that was reused for Xenoblade 3, 
but it could also be intentional, a seed that was planted as foreshadowing. The art book itself treats this as a huge mystery by intentionally drawing black lines in every text that could explain who is using this and how it functions. Then there's this mysterious black knight that appears before Lao after his reincarnation. We literally only get 2 seconds of zoomed out footage in this last section of the game. Man, Takashi really teased the shit out of us with this game. But thankfully, the art book gives us a better look at him. We still have zero clue who this is or why he appeared before Lao, but his appearance and role in the game reminds me a lot of consoles. In Xenoblade 3, they were Mobius who took control over Origin and they used this power to play with the lives of Origin and sustain themselves in the Endless Now. But in Xenoblade X, it could be the case that someone other than Zed has control over the realm and now the Black Knight could still represent the concept of consoles. And think about the life core itself. It is a system that was created to save human lives into a database and then recreate them afterwards. It has precisely the same function as Origin, but is not exactly the same system. If you think about it, the life hold is basically Origin 0.1. If Origin is not directly involved in this, then maybe the life core could still have similar side effects like Origin did. Now I hear you asking, wait a minute. That's cool and all, but how? When? Why? I don't think I can even explain the how and why. It could be a side effect of origin that created a different dimension in its proximity, maybe the life core caused similar problems, or it is something completely different. I am not writing the story. But how does this all fit into the timeline? Let me paint the theory for fun. This is not confirmed stuff, but what I feel like could have happened. The Zoha slash conduit was found on Earth and the government built three space stations to study this powerful artifact. They now had limitless energy and basically control over the entire world because of that. They built dousands of weapons and probably made a thousand bad decisions to no one's surprise. A group called the Saviorites came together to request a human rights protection bill that the government laughed at which would escalate into a war in the near future. Meanwhile, sometime after the Rona probably left us, in the mid-2020s, Elma came to Earth and warned us about an alien war that was about to happen above Earth. She provided us with lightspeed travel, Treon barriers and other alien tech that came in really handy. The coalition government formed Project Exodus as an escape plan to ensure the survival of humankind but publicly treated us as a colonization to different worlds, to not cause any mass hysteria. Only officials and higher ups knew what was really the case. Sometime around the year 2046 is when the radio broadcast actually happens and humanity starts leaving to other planets with one of the first 8 ships being named the Icarus. If you are wondering how I came up with 2046, it's because it is the last possible date before 2054 when X takes place where May 16 falls on a Wednesday. Yeah, that's what we Xeno theories are doing on our Sunday afternoon. Anyways, I picked the last possible date because the war with the Saviorites seems imminent but it could also easily take place in 2040, 2035 etc. Point is, humanity started traveling to space before the apocalypse started but then the fateful day arrived in July of 2054 and they not only had to deal with the alien war but also the Saviorites attacking them. The Saviorites could have also possibly learned about the government's nasty schemes of only sending the rich and influential to safety and it would give them another reason to resist. Right as the white whale leaves the earth, the professor named Klaus who was working for the conduit research team activated said conduit and it looked like earth exploded then and there. So far so good, but now we bump into another problem. We know the white whale was only wandering for two years in space before they landed on Mira and if the events of the alien war were at the same time when Klaus pressed the button then the timeline doesn't match at all. Even if we say Xenoblade 3 took place in one second because Mobius stopped the flow of time, both Allrest and Bionis lived for tens of thousands of years. My only explanation here is space-time dilation. 
Either the events of the Xenoblade trilogy only lasted two years in our universe because they actually played in a different parallel dimension where time flows differently or the white whale went through a wormhole and somehow ended up years later in the same proximity where earth once stood. This may sound like fan fiction but think about it. Both the Ghost and Ganglion were not specifically after humanity when they had their little war, but two years later they suddenly feel threatened by humans? Xenoblade X has the mystery of the Samarians that look exactly like humans that ruled over countless galaxies at one point. What if all this happened while the White Whale was jumping through a time wormhole? Or hey, they could have even traveled for thousands of years in space and the government planted false memories into their heads as we already established. They are all just data and were not awake during the space drifting years. Only Elma was in real stasis and she's an alien that could easily live for over thousands of years as far as we know. Basically there are options. I am not really too worried about this explanation. If my theory about origin turns out to be wrong, which is likely, then maybe the life hold itself could have produced similar effects to origin and the events of Xenoblade X just play out in a different part of space that is not connected to the main trilogy plot anymore. But I am betting money on origin because it could make the worlds feel more connected and it would also make all the Xenoblade 1 stuff in X make more sense. I don't think this timeline theory of mine is anything to hold on to, it's just a fun thought of what the events could have played out like, but I'm pretty sure Takahashi has something even more mind blowing in mind. I just know that X is guaranteed to be important to the overall lore in some way or another. So hold on tight until we get the sequel, in the year 2054. But what do you think? Does this theory make sense to you or would you rather see something else? Write your theories in the comments and I will be happy to read them all. Thank you so much for all the support and comments on my latest Xenoblade videos. You can't imagine how happy I am every time I see a new comment. And also don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you like Xenoblade because I am not guaranteed to always pop up in your recommendations. Also just do it for Nia.